uh, in Africa that have uh, in Indonesia and uh, I've just connected to that want to they're not able to have uh, the gospel preached to them because of their safety and uh, some places it's illegal to have a Bible so that's kind of why we're taking this today so uh, nice to see you all and, and nice to meet some of you and see you again sir would you open us for a prayer sir Father, we just thank you for this uh, church. Father, I thank you that uh, we can be here this morning. I pray that you'll be with the pastor as he brings your word to us. Father, anoint him. Father, speak to us through him. And uh, we give you all the praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, sir. If you would uh, do a uh, tradition that we don't always do, if you would stand for the reading of the word, Acts 2, 30. Seven. Sorry. Acts 2, chapter 37. This will make sense in a little bit. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their hearts. That means they were convicted in their hearts and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Thank you. That was short. You can be seated. Thank you. May God bless the reading of the word. The key is to get people to that point of saying, what should we do? Amen. Did you know that, and I like what, what Bruce and, and several of us in the community are doing, and I've not been able to participate lately because of my wife's health, uh, and that the fact that we are joining together several denominations with one purpose and, and that is to glorify God and bring people into the kingdom and to point them to the Savior. There's a way to do that and, and for years I was doing it the wrong way. I, I, and let me explain it for you. Did you know that 73% of people that don't go to church have never been asked? That is a travesty that we're, we're trying to fix. We're trying to address that issue. They'll never come if they've never asked. And some of you have asked people. And that to me is one of those amazing things that shows that the Spirit of God puts on your heart to rescue the perishing. The reason I say that is because today, 150,000 people will die today. That means 6,000 people will die by the time I'm finished speaking. In the last minute, there were 100 people that died. Now think of this, here's the world, 10 out of 10 die. The statistics on death are pretty impressive, okay? And, and, it's, and it's incredible. Only 30% roughly of the world's population are Christian. So today, 105,000 people are going to go to hell because they've not heard the gospel. Oh. They've not heard the gospel of repentance and faith. And I'm going to explain to you how you can witness to somebody without even memorizing scripture and, and tell them, point them to the fact that it says, what must I do to be saved? That's what I want to reach people and make them reach that point. And let me tell you why. In modern evangelism, we've kind of made it like, well, we want to bring you to the church so we can... Uh, support your family or we can have a workshop on this or we can uh, do certain things for you to improve we've got activities that you can join but we're bringing them for the wrong reasons in many cases because and I'll explain that to you Psalm 19 verse 7 is a very I've read this many times until it finally rang a bell it is a, it is a way that the Apostle Paul witnessed to people. It's the way that uh, Jesus witnessed to people. Uh, Peter. It's the way that they used, it, the method of evangelism that they used was a very effective one. And it takes advantage of something uh, that the law is kind of a schoolmaster. It points us to Christ. It shows us the impossibility of being saved by keeping the law. Now, we're not saying the law is going to save anybody, but the law directs the person to the need. It points them to the cross. Show them the wrath of God without belief in Christ, and hopefully they'll run to the cross. And, and that's the whole idea. Psalm 19, verse 7. 
and ask the question. And I'm like, sorry about that. Psalm 19, verse 7. The law of the Lord is perfect. We know that's true. We are not perfect. The law of the Lord is perfect. Converting the soul. That first part. The word converting is an interesting word. It is like a resurrection, a restoration. It's a regeneration. It's like I've been restored a new car in my car. It is like I put a new engine in it. What the law does, it converts the soul. Now the Holy Spirit does that conversion. But what it is, like for example, if you went to the doctor and the doctor came out to you before he even examined you and he goes, here's your prescription. I want you to take this three times a day, come back in a week. They're not going to likely take the prescription that can say, I feel fine. There is nothing wrong with me. But now, using the law of God, the Ten Commandments, I'm going to take him to, here's your, here's your x-rays. And, and here's the results of your blood test. You're going to die. If I don't see them first seeing that they need the cure of Christ and the blood of the Lamb, they're never going to run to the cross. Unless they know that they are separated, Isaiah 59, 2 says, right now you're separated from God. Jack and I used a very interesting way when we talked to Michael, I think it was, and this is a year ago or more. We went out there and asked him, would you consider yourself to be a good person? Guess what, about 95 to 98% of people are going to say, yeah, I'm a pretty good person. And the thing is, I think he really believed that. I think our human nature says we all are good persons. We, we feel like, yeah, he's a pretty good guy. If I said that about a lot of you, I would say that. You're a pretty good person. But I'm using a human standard. When the truth is, and we try to communicate that to Mike, the law of God says none are good. There's not even one. None does good. None seeks after God, even. And Romans 3, 23, we all fall short of God's glory. So he still thought he was a pretty good person. So we tried to do this. He said, have you ever, ever told a lie? Oh, yeah. He's, had, he's told a lie before. What would that make you? Now, some of you have heard this before, and I apologize. Some of you have never heard it before. And this is kind of amazing because it's a little difficult to do. So you might want to throw yourself under the bus, so to speak. It says, well, so a lie. It says, what does that make you? Some of them will say a liar. They'll confess it. And says, and some will say a stealer. And I'm saying, I'm not talking about Pittsburgh. No, this is, this is not, I'm not a stealer fan. You are, if you're stealing something, for example, you are a thief. If you've ever looked at a woman or a man with lust in your heart, Jesus said that's the same as adultery. So, you still consider yourself a pretty good person. If they still resist that, law to the proud Grace to the humble. You know what Jesus, when the young rich ruler came to Jesus, he said, what must I do? That was the first problem. You can't do anything. You can't do anything to save yourself. And so he started justifying himself. Well, I, I, I've kept this commandment. I've never stolen. I've never lied. I've never, and, and probably the truth is he probably had broken them all since he got out of bed this morning. Because that's our nature. Our human nature, our, our hearts are wicked and evil. Jeremiah 79 says, who can know it? It's so desperately wicked. And I say my own too. So now I tell the guy, you've admitted to me, Mike, that you're a lying, thieving. And in fact, he was a blasphemer at heart because he blasphemed me kind of with us without knowing it. Adulterer of heart. Do you still consider yourself a pretty good person? Because you're yeah, a really great person, not just a good person. I says, well, then you're going to break the law, and you're going to go before a real judge, and, and you're going to tell the judge, Your Honor, I'm a pretty good person. He says, yeah, I, I, I can see by your behavior that now you seem to be good, but, but it, regardless, you've broken the law. Well, I will try to do better, and I'm sorry. He says, well, I hope you will do better, because you'll have time to think about it. You're guilty. You're going to jail. He cannot justify himself before a human court. Neither can we justify ourselves before a heavenly court. We're all lawbreakers. So the point is, if we point the Ten Commandments, the Ten Canons of the Law, and make them duck and make them flee from the wrath of God, until they see the wrath of God is relevant, they're never going to see the mercy is, is important. They, they will not understand that they have the wrath of God abiding on them. Jesus said in John 3, 36, 
He says, whoever does not believe in me has the wrath of God abiding on them. Instead, we go out and tell people the gospel that says, you know, Jesus loves you. Uh, God loves you. Come as you are. Uh, you're fine just as you are. But the Bible says in contrary to that, none of us are good. Right. Jesus said that, it, and uh, Paul said in Romans 5, 8, that, that he, we're enemies. He died for us while we were still enemies. And we were wicked sinners. Read, Romans 5 should humble us <laughs> that none of us are worthy. So now the guy still thinks he's still a pretty good person. I said, you go try to break the law and say that the judge, you're a good person, and see if that gets you out of, out of court. It's not going to. You're going to end up in jail. So what that is trying to do is to humble the guy and to make him see that he needs the blood of the Lamb of God and there's no other cleansing that you can be saved by to be plunged. We had three baptisms here last week, uh, uh, the last couple of weeks. And so that's a glory to God. But what happened is they saw their need for repentance and faith and I love what Paul, uh, what Peter did on the day of Pentecost. He convicted them. He basically said that you guys have murdered Jesus. You've, you've murdered the author of life. And he put, the, put the, what they actually did on them. And they finally were convicted. And they said they saw they were in trouble. What are we going to do? Good question. That's what you want to get the unsaved people to ask, what have I got to do? Michael never did quite get to that point. He still thought he was a pretty good person. And he, I says, well, you know what? Here's your history. You're a good person, but you're, you've done this, 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 like me too, like all of us have done. Then it says, Revelation 21.8 says, all liars, uh, all sexual immorals, all thieves will end in the lake of fire. I says, if you consider yourself a good person, that's by your standard. But the standard of God says he judges us by the Ten Commandments, by the way that we fail. Now, none of us can keep the law. That's clear. Because, and if we try, we're trying to add to our salvation. But the law is a schoolmaster teaching us, you had better do this, or you're going to have time out, and it's the big time out. The law is not wicked. Paul said the law was good and holy and just. Not that we can keep the law to be saved, but it points people to the need for the Savior. It's like if you're running through a, a, a 15 mile per hour speed limit, and you went through a, it's a, and you're going 55 miles per hour, and you didn't see the sign, and they said, you know what? They, they pulled you over. You just sped through a speed limit sign where, at school for the blind at 15 miles per hour, and you broke the law. If the guy did not see the sign, he would have never known he'd broken the law. All lawbreakers at heart. So, you know, it, it's foolishness. The cross obviously is foolishness to those that are perishing. So, a de good definition of what sin is. If people don't know what sin is, sin is, well, I did this and I did that. The John, the Apostle John says in 1 John 3, 4, and, and this is a good memory verse for me because I used it a, a couple of times, that sin is the transgression of the law. And that's not talking about the Mosaic law. We're not talking about the rituals and the washings because those were done away. Those were nailed to the cross. But it, it, sin is the transgression of the law. So Romans uh, 3, 19 through 20, I'm going to turn to. This is kind of like the Romans road. You walk down the Romans road, and I kind of interesting that the Roman road was a real Roman road, and some of those roads still exist today. And and they established those uh, kind of a, a peaceful settlement government, more or less, the Roman Empire. They gave access to the gospel. So what they were doing for armies to be able to, to be dispatched to control, they opened up paths for the gospel to be spread throughout uh, Judea and into Asia Minor and into Italy and. And elsewhere. So in, in Romans 3.10, this is the method that Paul used. In fact, this is this little book of Romans is how uh, Martin Luther was saved because I think he realized that he was never going to be able to be saved apart. He, he, and in fact, at one point, he said he actually hated God because he didn't think he could ever uh, reach the standard uh, of perfection because we all fall short of the glory of God. Romans chapter 3, verse 19 through 20. You know, everybody is born with a conscience. Conscience means con with. Science means knowledge. So we want to circumnavigate arguments. Well, I don't believe in God. and I would. Well, go to the conscience. Forget about, you know, how do you explain creation and what about evolution and all that stuff. Bypass it, and I'll show you how you can do that. Romans 3, verses 19. 
Now we know in, in Romans 3, 19, we know that what things, whatsoever things the law says, it says to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no one flesh will be saved alive, or no one justified in his sight. <coughs> but by the law, there's the knowledge of sin. See, if, if he had never recognized that he, like us, are lawbreakers, he would have not realized he, he was sinning. We never did get very far with Mike, but see, because Jesus never offered, when the, when the young rich ruler came, Jesus never offered him the gospel because he was still worried about doing he says, well, I did this, I did that, and I did this. So Peter never offered, when he, on the day of Pentecost, he said, repent and be baptized. That wouldn't go well first. He first had to humble them and make them see the need, the conviction that they fall short of the glory of God. Romans 7, 7 says, uh, Paul says, he had not known sin except by the law. You know, Michael was a good guy. He seemed like he was a pretty nice guy. But then we found out more about him. And he had no knowledge of, this, of, his, of the sin. He did not know what sin was. And it's the breaking of God's law. And I'll give you an example of that in Matthew 9, verse 37. And I was wrong about that. Uh, 9... 37 through 38. Matthew 9, 37 through 38. And I'm going to paraphrase it. And that's why I think part of what, what Bruce is doing is kind of an answer to a prayer that we've been praying for a long time in some of us. And, and how many of you remember years ago, a couple of years, several, five years ago now, that I asked to be praying for the Lord of the harvest to send forth more laborers? Mm -hmm. And it's happened. Jesus said in Matthew 9, 37 through 38, Pray to the Lord of the harvest, for the harvest is plenty, but laborers are so few. I paraphrase that a little bit, but I know some of you here have been out in the labor fields. You've been harvesting, working uh, with the court system with uh, juvenile offenders. Some of you have been riding prisoners. Uh, some of you have been bringing people to Christ. Uh, some of you have been walk, prayer walking and, and trying to reach Christ and, and try to... So the idea here is uh, we, we still need to continue to pray to the Lord of the harvest to bring in more laborers because I still feel... And the harvest field out there is... You guys went all the way into Central County and to Peck, didn't you? On your prayer walks, you went all over... You know, in a circumference around Mulvane. They are participating in the harvest because, you know, prayer comes... It's vital before uh, you do any evangelism. Uh, because that is key to any, any evangelism at all. In fact, it, three days ago, they had a fire. Just what, was it was west of Bell, east of Bell Plain, about a mile and a half. And then they had another fire about a quarter mile east. Interesting analogy. The house was on fire. It was an older house, no smoke alarms. A neighbor pounded on his door, saw smoke early in the morning, took a walk, he normally is not up. He couldn't sleep. He got up and walked, you know, took and walked his dog, and he saw the smoke was on the fire, uh, and, and he pounded on the door. Save the guy's life. The analogy is people, without warning them, there is a fire coming, and it's a big fire. And if we're not knocking on doors, not necessarily, or knocking on people's hearts, we're not warning them about the fire because it is a little bit difficult to go up to somebody, cold call, you don't know anybody, you know, and witness to them and, and share the gospel about Christ and ask them, would you consider yourself a good person? Because what that does, it points them to uh, its self-righteousness. And until I knock down that self-righteousness or, or the Holy Spirit convicts them, they're never going to come to faith. Think of, think of it this way. And this is a true story, which I thought about uh, George too. A guy was walking his dog and he saw a house on fire downstairs, and he knew he st he went and by and he and he thought, well, you know what? That's none of my business. You know, I really need to pay to whatever people want to do is up to them. No, what he did is he went up to the house and he started pounding on the door. No answer, and he could see a little fire in the back of the kitchen. So he he just yelled and screamed, and nobody woke up. Finally, he took a 
from the from the porch, he took a lawn chair and smashed the window. He wasn't shy about trying to witness to people. He didn't care what people thought about it. Well, that's kind of a narrow-minded thing, you know. Well, that's kind of cocky. Well, how can you do such a thing? Because the guy was going to die without that. When we get into the kingdom of heaven, I doubt very much when we get there, we'll look back at our past and say, man, I sure wouldn't, wished I wouldn't embarrass myself by talking to that guy on the corner about Christ. I really made a fool of myself, and I was really embarrassed, and he called me names. I wish I hadn't done that. We're not going to have those. We, the regrets we might have is, why didn't I talk to my aunt? Or why didn't I tell my neighbor uh, about Christ? You know, we, we're supposed to go all the, into the, all the world. And I realized I didn't even go next door. Shame on me. So I love the idea that that's what we're doing now, is taking the gospel uh, to the whole world. Uh, and that's what we're... You know, it's really one thing to, to know. It's not our responsibility to save anybody. It takes the pressure off. Forget about it. Don't worry about it. It's not your responsibility to save anybody. It is their response to his ability. But it is our responsibility to tell them. No. So really that takes the pressure off. The Holy Spirit convicts them. Uh, and the Word of God uh, it takes the Word of God with the Spirit of God, with the person of God to make the children of God for the glory of God. None of that was about me. It was all about Him. Amen. So if you think of it in that way, uh, that, that's kind of what... You know, I don't, I don't think I will ever... What, one thing the law does, and here's what the law does, and it's a good... And the law is good. You have to remember that. <laughs> It, it, it slays us, it convicts us, it judges us, it condemns us, it weighs on us, and, it, and yet, we delight in it. It's sweeter than honey. Uh, it's in our hearts. How then do we get the law of God to penetrate the stony heart? Use the Bible. Use the commandments to convict a person that they are in trouble without the blood of Christ. I want to try to get to the point where in uh, Jeremiah 31, 33. This is why it's really not chapter uh, 31, verse 33. This is why I don't worry about the, how, if, I'm, if I don't say it just perfectly or if I don't exactly have the right words to say because there's something that Jeremiah foretold years ago. And even though this was specifically to, you'll notice in, uh, it's Israel and Judah, because Israel split off in the northern kingdoms and became Israel, and Judah was the southern kingdom. So, Jeremiah 31, verse, and I'm going to back, back up to 31 through 33. Behold, the days come, says the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Notice they're two different houses. Not according to the covenant made with their fathers in that day, I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. Symbolic of coming out of sin. Egypt, kind of symbolic of sin. And God delivered us out of sin and the penalty of sin. And I'm going to skip ahead to verse 33. But this shall be the covenant that I will make by the house of Israel after those days, said the Lord. I will put my law in their inward parts and I will write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. Paul said the same thing basically in 2 Corinthians 3. 2 Corinthians 3.3, 3, in fact. I won't turn there, but I'll paraphrase. 2 Corinthians 3.3. 3. It's going to be a law not written on tablets of stone, but it actually the language says on tablets of human heart. You know, the heart is a lot better. He's going to take out the stony heart and put in the flesh heart because you know what? Uh, stone, stones can be broken. And like Moses lost his temper and smashed the Ten Commandments. Because, because they had smashed the Ten Commandments. When he came down, they had broken them all. And yes, it was kind of a thing. The temper, he probably lost his cool. But, you know, you can't blame Moses because, you know, there was a lot of grumbling going on <coughs> at that time. So, Paul, what he's saying is Paul is saying that God is going to write the law on our hearts. Just expose them to the law. Expose them to the need for Christ, for grace. No one's saved by the works of the law. But the, the law points us to our need for Christ. 
You know, interesting, I find that the largest chapter in the Bible, I would have thought, what about grace or the gospel or, or Calvary or, or something like that? Psalm 119, the longest chapter in the verse, and the central chapter is about the law. Psalm 119, I won't turn to it and read it because that's going to be 197 verses, and I, I won't try that. Not to read it. Since that is the longest chapter in the Bible by far, do you think it symbolizes significance? You know, that, that there's no coincidence, I think, for because that is the longest, the largest chapter. It focuses on the law. And you'll, you'll see in reading Psalm 19, study that sometime. It has nothing to do with Calvary. I mean, it has nothing to do with uh, uh, rituals and, you know, the drink offerings and blood sacrifices. It has only to do with, with God's law. And it is called the Royal, and it's called the royal Law. Here's some things that the law does. And, and you think that... We, the law is not necessarily good and, and, it, and it's contrary to our nature. The law reflect, reflects the lawgiver. Okay, it reflects the holiness and, and purity and standard of God. The law reflects the lawgiver. The law reflects his character. Uh, the law exposes our fallen nature. And I'll tell you, point to that in James 1. In Verse 22 through 25. If you don't want to turn there, I'll read it for you in the King James. James 1, 22 through 25. But you be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own self. For any be a hearer of the word and not a doer of the word, He's like a man beholding his natural face in a glass mirror. In other words, you've got an image and you let the mirror and you forgot all of it. What was in the mirror? You forgot about it. For he beholds himself and goes right away, straight away forgets what manner of man he was. But whoever looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues therein, he not being not a forgetful hearer but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deeds or in his doing. I like the idea of doing, trying to, uh, not that you're saved by doing the law, but it is a mirror. Uh, the law points to us. You know, it's not going to shave you. It's going to tell you you need to do something. You need to make you show how short you fall of God's glory. Yeah. It's, it's a mirror to us and to our nature. And, and the next verse, Chapters, you know, doing something, saying something is really easy. I've said it before. Love is a verb. It's what you do, not what you say. Now, it's of course you need to say something, and you need to occasionally, you know, acknowledge that. If if love is not any word, then then I'm just going to shove flowers my wife and see you later. Now, I want to express love, but my but my love being a verb. Is me taking the trash out, cleaning the litter box out, I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do that, I'm going to honey do this, I'm going to honey do that, because I love her. Not because I, I feel compelled to do it, but because I'm obligated to do it, because I want to do it. Same thing with the law. We should be a, a compelled to obey somebody that we love. And now I'm not obeying my wife in that sense, but I'm doing things to, because I love her, I'm doing something. So if we depend on feelings, then Jesus may have never gone to the cross because three times he prayed to have a cup removed. It, and it's all about what he's doing. And I'm seeing this in this church here, and I'm seeing this community. Pure religion is this, undefiled before God in James 1.27, to feel for the fatherless, to pray for the fatherless, to pray, so I'll pray for you orphans. No. No. To visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unspotted from the world or from sin, basically. None of us are not going to be do that perfectly, of course, and it's not possible to abstain from all sin because John 1, 1 John 1, 8 and 10 say we all sin, and if we don't say that, we're liars. We're telling God we're liars. So Amen. Next week, we're going into the nursing home, and we're going to do a sermon, and we're going, to give a, we're going to visit the orphans and the widows. How many there in a nursing home are orphans and widows? And I asked them that one time. 
planes shot up. They're all of them. All of them. And of course, if you refer to Matthew 25, it talks about visiting those in prison and sick and those. And we have several people here that do that already. Uh, we have a prison ministry. There's another guy that's going to get out in a couple weeks. Uh, and we've he kind of been rejected by his family and his friends and his uh, old church. And I says, you know what? And he feels unworthy to come here. And I talked to you think about that, Jack. He said, this guy feels so unworthy. He, he feels his past and I can't do it. I'm not worthy to come. And, and I'm such a wretch. And I says, perfect. You're going to fit in perfectly here. Because at, at the foot of the cross, you know what? It's all level. And nobody's passed on. And nobody's done that. It's all level. And we're all, if you took measurements, we'd all be the same. So you're welcome. The fact that you told me that makes you think you're going to be perfect here because you're joining other train wrecks and wretches that have overcome by the blood of the Lamb by no means perfect, but none of us are worthy, my friend. If it was the only place for worthy people, this building would be empty. Amen. So he's, that's another part of pure religion. We're reaching out to prisoners. You know, the guy in Winfield wants to come. He wants to move here to Mulvane so he can be in the church. I says, no, don't follow the church but, but he says he's not. He's not following a person or anything like that. But he's following what he's seeing people do. And it's not about me. i got nothing to brag about. Oh, Jack, you're so sick. No, you're, you, let me act like the moon. I'm reflecting the glory of God. Amen. I've, I've got a dark side. We've all got a dark side. And, and really, the whole moon is dark. It's just the sun lights it up. So the glory goes to the moon. So I'm trying to remind him and keep myself humble and before God that I'm no better than anybody else. I've told Jack that. I've told the other Jack that. I've been, we have a third Jack here. Maybe not yet, but it could happen. But it's interesting. But, uh, so I want him to realize that, that none of us are good. So the law uh, reflects the character, uh, the, the lawgiver. It reflects his character, moral purity. It exposes our fallen nature. It, but it also lights the lamp. It lights the path. Uh, Psalm 119, 105 says, the law lights our path. It's a, it's a lighted path. And not only lights the path, but shines upon our feet. So now we can know where we're going because it gives us an opportunity. It's like being in a movie theater and it's those little lights that you see in the aisle. That's the law of God. Now how can it not be not good? It is good. It is not that we keep it that makes us good because none of us are good. But it points us to that law converts to stony hearts. We've already read that. Psalm 19, 7. Again, the law converts. The word converts is like I said earlier, it is like a regeneration. It's like Lazarus was regenerated by Jesus saying, Lazarus, come forth. That was, that's, the, that's the picture of regeneration uh, of uh, what the law of God did, what it does with the Spirit of God and the law of God, the Word of God, the children of God. With, by a person of God makes the children of God. So that it's all, uh, all ties together. Uh, the law shows us what places God. You know, we, we obey God not because, you know, we're going to obey or we're going to burn, but because we love Him. We yes. want to uh, be an obedient. Uh, God is love, yes. But look, God is holy and righteous and just and pure and demands that we are... We repent and turn to Christ. That's why Paul finally got humbled the crowd enough to the where they said, what are we going to do? We're, we're in trouble. That's what, that's what you want them to do first because when I was sitting in a prison cell years ago, I'm thinking, what am I going to do? I'm going to get out. I'm not going to have any money. They're going to give me a new suit. They're going to give me $10 and it's up to 20 now, I think it is, or whatever it is. And it says, what am I going to do? God had to humble me put me on my face, behind bars, after such a, such a wretch. I said, what am I going to do? Jesus is probably thinking, finally he asked the right question. <laughs> I was waiting for that. How much further can you go than a jail cell in concrete, no privacy, all freedoms gone? Can I get you any more humble now, Jack? Will you finally look up? I'm as low as I can go. There's only one way to look up. They had to humble me. And that's what we tried to do to Mike. Mike kept justifying himself, but they said that uh, Romans 3, 10, and 19, and 20 says no man is justified by the words or what their deeds or their works. Uh, so the, so I'm, gonna, I'm still in James. I'm going to turn to 8. 13. 
And actually, I'm going to go to verse 10. I beg your pardon. James 2, verse 10. Now, you can carry the law too far because you can live by the law because it's like, it's, it's like Jesus plus works uh -oh, equals nothing. Okay, be careful because that's what I have tried to do. When I, when I went through this, I thought, you know, I'm a lawbreaker like everybody else, but if the James 2, verse 10 says, Whoever shall keep the whole law, yet offend in one point, you're guilty of it all. So I don't want you to think to go from one ditch to the other, like, you know, the law doesn't save us, you know, but, but, and, and we're free from the law, but, you know, we don't want to go to, to two extremes to try to keep the law to be just because. And here is the law. Here is the law that we're talking about here in the New Testament. It never refers to the Mosaic law unless it specifically says that by Paul. When you hear the law, that's what this is talking about. What it is it? For he, in James 2, verse 11, for he that says, do not commit adultery, said also, do not kill. But if you commit no adultery, now if you, if thou commit no adultery, yet if you still kill, you're still a transgressor of the law. That's interesting because that's what the Apostle John says. Sin is the transgression of the law. It's like transgressing over past. Transgress is to mean to go past or beyond what is supposed to be there. The laws are borders. We have guardrails and highways that, that we want to keep in one ditch from the other. And they're th not there to harm us. They're there to It's like keep these or else no. Keep these and don't hurt yourself. That's the intent. That's the moral intent of the law. Uh, because it's just like, for example, if we had no rules at our home when my children were growing up, well, daddy's love, dad's love, he loves, whatever you want to know. That's not love. That's, that's uh, indifference. Uh, that's apathy. Uh, the, the opposite of love is not hate. It's apathy. It's like, I don't care. Whatever you want to do. That is the opposite of love. You cannot have discipline without love. So that's kind of what he's saying in there, that... The, the law is actually also a shield. The law is a teacher in Galatians 3.24. I think Galatians 3.24, the law is a teacher. It shows us for the sin. And you know what? God loves His law. We've got to love God. And we gotta, if we love God, we're going to love His law. If you look at Romans 13, we were talking about this earlier. It's funny how this stuff comes out. The law restrains evil in society. So there's nothing wrong with the law. It's society, and it's me, and it's my heart. God's law restrains evil. God's law reflects sin. Like, and here's the x-ray. You can't see into my heart, but if you could, it would be desperately wicked and evil. And, and now he's given me a new heart, and, and, it's, and it's a heart that is bent toward uh, serving him and witnessing to him and loving him. Paul said it is holy, it is just, it is good. It is just the opposite of me. And it's just the opposite of all of us. So God's law lights the way. And uh, man's law, not so much, but it is in alignment many times with the law of God. I find that interesting that it does. It's, uh, so it restrains evil, and, it, and it's, uh, it also is part of the gospel presentation. And I think, I'm trying to give you one last example here of in Matthew 19, and I'm probably going to end up closing here because I went a little fast and if I go fast I really apologize uh, about that. I, what, I, what I have discovered though is the law the conviction of sin, the need for repentance and the blood of the Lamb and sanctification and holiness and confession of uh, sin that gospel is buried under a lot of seeker sensitive uh, pew filling, man pleasing strategies and, and excuses and, and, uh, and I was there too I thought my duty was to just love unconditionally, and that is part of our love. But part of the love is speaking the truth. If you saw somebody headed for a cliff, and you knew the guy was blind or hearing impaired, and you know he's headed for the cliff, and that's judgment, and you're going to think, hey, well, I don't want, that's none of my business, you know. Who am I to judge? I'm just going to go out and love the guy, you know. Love warns to flee from the wrath of God. There's a coming wrath of God. And it's one of the most loving things you can do to warn them of impending doom that is coming toward them unless they repent and believe. I want them to get to say, what shall I do to be saved? That, that's, I want to reach them to that point. If they never reach that point, 
uh, then, then I'm not really, they're not going to be convicted and they're going to think that they're, they're good as they are. But in, uh, in Matthew 19, and I'm going to finish with this, a great example of why Jesus used the law to convict him. And the young man never got it. Now, it, it's also interesting to know when he came to Jesus, he didn't say, you need to repent and believe. He wouldn't have accepted it. Any more than, than on the day of Pentecost, Paul knew they wouldn't accept, repent, and believe because they didn't know what to repent from. They didn't know they needed saving from what? Matthew 19, verse 16. Here's an indication this young man did not, or this young, uh, did not really know who Jesus was. And behold, Matthew 19, 16, one came and said unto him, Good Master, well, how about Lord and Savior? I mean, he didn't, the Messiah, he didn't know who he was. So this will explain why Jesus said this. What good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? I want people to ask, that's a great question. I wish they would ask that. Jesus knew his heart. He thought, what must I do? Ain't nothing you can do to be saved. Here's the universal symbol of what you can do for me. Say zero. Okay, you can do nothing. Because Christianity, all other religions, all other beliefs in the world except for Christianity are do, uh, do, and do, and do, and do, and Jesus. Done. <laughs> Stop the do. Done is what I want. And then Jesus said, why do you call me good? There's going back to Romans chapter 3 again. Now, Jesus was good. But he did not understand that Jesus was God yet. That's why he said, what do you call me good? People say, well, this proves that, you know, he was not really a man. He was a man, part God. He was a prophet. No, 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 no. He's answering the man because he thought he was just master. He's a master. Hi, teacher. You know, when I worked, when I taught in the public schools, they say, they, hi, te hi, teacher. You know, I got a name. Well, you can use my name. It's okay. You know. So that's what, he did not really realize who Jesus was. And he said unto him, why you call me good? There is none good. Hey, Paul robbed that quote, didn't he? Plagiarist? No, I'm kidding. That's biblical. That's in the Old Testament. I'm kidding. I, know, I don't want to be hard on Paul. Not you, Paul, but the Apostle Paul. The other, yeah. And he said unto him, which, okay, then he said, none is good. No one that is God. Okay, only God's good. But he's focused on doing. So the man, he goes, and I like how he's, if you want to enter eternal life, I do, I do think there are three ways. He kind of is not saying this, but I would say, there's three ways to get to heaven. Live a perfect life? Oh, I can't do that. Uh, die before age of accountability, like in a baby? My time has passed. Or, or actually, there's a fourth. Believe in the Son of God, and you'll be saved. And there's another path. Miss Oprah Winfrey, many paths to God, lady. And I'm sorry, I'm throwing her under the bus. There's many paths to God. Sure there are. There's one that faces the judgment. The white throne, great white throne judgment. Yeah, there's many paths. But the one path you don't want to take. Stay away. Sorry, tangent here. <coughs> if you want to enter eternal life, keep the commandments. All right, he finally did. Now I can do something. I have something tangible that I can really do. Wait a second. Verse 18, he said, which, which, the guy's asking which ones. <laughs> you, I thought you kept these. I thought you knew all these. You, know, you can't memorize them. Exodus 20, verses 1 through 18. Oh, come on, snap it off. Now, he said, which, I thought he was keeping them all. He said, you shall not murder. There's identity of the law right there. He's talking about the Ten Commandments. You can't nail tablets of stone to a cross. Okay, those were not nailed to the cross. Those are written in stone by the finger of God. Papyrus, it, it disintegrates. The commandments are permanent. Okay, that, that's why, I, I want to throw that in there, but that's why they were written by the finger of God in stone. Permanent. You shall not murder. Jesus said, hating somebody in the heart is the same as murdering in your heart. Matthew chapter 5. 
So just don't think it's, you know, it's the act of it itself. It's intent. You shall not commit adultery. Anything about Jesus. If you're looking at a woman or man, depending on who you are, uh, and you're thinking lustful thoughts, you've committed adultery in your heart. So it's just not external, it's internal too. You shall not bear false, uh, steal, I'm sorry, you shall not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And in verse 20, if this young man was playing on a professional football team or basketball team, he would right now say, all of these I've kept. You know, he'd pound his fist and then he'd point to his name on the back of the jersey and you really think he's kept all of this? If he did, why is he not in heaven? <laughs> like the young man we talked to. He said he was good, 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 good. Now he's actually great. I said, why are you here on heaven? You should have been glorified already and been in the presence of the Lord. He didn't know how to answer that. I kept, we kept pointing and he never did get humble. He never came to the point where he says, what do I need to do? So I didn't offer him the gospel until his heart was prepared. He says, what am I going to do? I'm in trouble. So until I could do that, I'm not going to offer it. Neither did Jesus. The young man said, all these things I have kept from my youth. And I bet you he had not kept them from the moment he got stepped out of bed. I bet he'd broken several of them, maybe even in his heart. I know he did one, coveting. He did another, first commandment. He made money as God. You know, he worshipped money, so there's another. You know, he's breaking all of the commandments, basically. Verse 20, the young man said to him, All these things I've kept. I'm perfect. No problem. Jesus said unto him, Okay. He's now identified his God. I think my wallet's in there, but his money, that was his God. Please, yeah, I think it's there. All of these things I kept, Jesus said, okay, if you want to be perfect, not possible, go and sell all that you have and give it to the poor and you shall have treasure in heaven and come follow me. Now he's not feeling so good anymore. Because in verse 22, when they're Young man heard that. He went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. For him, money was God, provided for his needs, and took care of him, and paid for all his bills. It's something he fell back on, and now all he didn't do is bow down and worship to it, but in his heart, he had made money as God. So, God. so the point is, Jesus never offered him the gospel of repentance and faith because he was not willing to accept it. He still was focused on do, 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 do. I need to do this, I need to do that. What can I do to be saved? Nothing. There is not anything that you can do to be saved. So the next time you have an opportunity of finding someone on the street, I suggest that we probably will try to go out this summer again in this late spring. Uh, I find Saturdays are about the best mornings to go out because of the experience. I've made a lot of mistakes and tried to pick a weeknight and their kids in the bath and homework and everything, you know, and, dogs chasing and all this other stuff. So we want to use that and not to go to them and say, you know, we, we would like, you're welcome to worship with us and it, it's not about us. We don't pass out tracts. Here, here's our church name or here's our church. He says, have you, do you know what it means to repent and believe? Have you ever been saved? Can you tell me your conversion story? It might be the next time it says, uh, you know, can we pray for you? One time we went through and asked for somebody to, can we pray for you and you can find out if they're a believer or not. If not, pray for them right there on the spot and pray for them and know that we care for them. So uh, until the law humbles them and shows them that how far short they, sh they fall short of God's glory, His holy standard, they're never going to be humble. And they're never going to say, what must I do to be saved? And that's what I wanted to get to do. Thank you. Bruce, could you close for us, sir? Sure. Yeah, let's all stand. Let's all stand. Lord Jesus, uh, we have been blessed today just to be in your presence and to hear your message through Jack and what repentance is and what coming 
under conviction is and how that leads to life by what you've done on the cross. Lord, we, we do appreciate the law as Jack has shared with us so well that it is perfect and it is a guideline to you and, and the need of our your mercy for us. Lord, thank you for uh, just bringing the body of Christ together today from different denominations and to, to worship you and to be the body. We love you and ask for your mercy and your grace and your healing touch to be upon each of the people here today. That your love would penetrate and meet all needs that only you can meet. We thank you, Father, for that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, sir.